This is going to be Psalms chapter 9, and we're going to look at some amazing things about God. So Psalms 9 and verse 1, to the chief musician upon Muthlaban, a psalm of David. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Now let's first look at the marvelous work of his hands. In Psalms 145, verses 3 and 4, it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. So God made the heavens. He made men out of the dust of the ground. His greatness is unsearchable. He's greatly to be praised, as the verse said. One generation shall praise his works to another. His works are worthy to be bragged about. Thank God that the God who made man is not a mean God, as the atheists claim. He's a good God. Psalms 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He has marvelous works, and they're all done in truth. You don't want to forget about his marvelous works and the things he's done for you. Because if you do, you'll begin to quit living for him, and you'll begin living for the flesh. Psalm 78, 7 says that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. If your mind is staying on the works of God, then you're going to be more likely to keep the commands of God. Psalms 86, 8, Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. Psalms 143, 5, I remember the days of old, I meditate on all thy works, I muse on the work of thy hands. And if we want to be more like the Lord, then we need to work with our hands, which in 2019 you don't see much of this. But Psalms 9-1, To the chief musician upon Muthlaban, the psalm of David, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. So praise him for his marvelous works. Some of the best praise you can do is by yourself. Then it's really, really all about him and with your whole heart. God knows who is faking praise and who really means it. And these fakers on TV trying to get your money aren't fooling God for a second. Are they really praising God or are they just being fakers? Mark 7, 6 says, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They're not praising with their whole heart. They're praising with their lips, but they don't really mean it in their heart. But the gods can see their heart. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart, according to 1 Samuel 16, 7. But our prayers should involve praise. Hebrews thirteen fifteen says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the verse says here in Psalms chapter 9, it says your whole heart. He wants all of your heart. He doesn't want part of your heart going after the world. He doesn't want to share you with Fortnite. He doesn't want to share you with binge-watching TV shows all the time like Game of Thrones that you shouldn't be watching. He doesn't want to share you, share you with these wicked uh, singers like Billie Eilish and Ariana Grande. And if you're taking those wicked things in your eyes and ears, then you are trying to force the Lord to share you with the world. And he doesn't have your whole heart, if that's your situation. Psalms 9-2 says, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou Most High. So not only does he have marvelous works, but the Bible calls him the Most High. Isaiah 14 says, Satan said, he will be like the Most High. And the Lord just said, keep dreaming. There is no struggle between God and the devil. 
Colossians chapter 1 says all things were made by him and for him, and that includes the devil. Ezekiel 28 lets us know he is a created being. The devil wants worship in song, and here it says to sing praise to the Most High. Music is to worship the Lord. You worship in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The devil gets worship through his music. The godless Taylor Swift is a song leader for Satan, and she's promoting the LGBT stuff to her young girls. In this country, she's full of the devil. She dresses like a whore in her music videos, and she promotes all things that are ungodly and against the commands of God. And she is a prime example of someone who worships Satan in song and leads other people to worship Satan in song. But the Lord is the Most High. And we aren't anything compared to God. All that He does is right, and everything I do is wrong, unless what I'm doing agrees with what He says to do. And when I do what He says to do, I can't take credit for it because it's Him working through me. So He should get all the glory. He should get all the praise and admiration and everything good that a Christian does is only because they let Him do it through them. And when a Christian's motive for serving is to become the greatest or be the most high, then he's confused about why we are even here to begin with. But in 2019, the temptation to make a name like the people at the Tower of Babel is pretty high temptation. They said, let us make us a name. And what were they doing? They were trying to go up, trying to get up high. But the Lord is so up high that everything is under his feet. It says in Ephesians 1, 21 and 22, it says he's far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of over all things to the church. So everything's under his feet. Now Psalms 9 and verse 3, When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. So next we see that God is a deadly presence to enemies. Notice the enemies fall back like at a Benny Hinn meeting. But in the Bible, when it's someone worshiping in the Bible, they fall on their face. Funny, at these charismatic meetings, you mostly see them just falling on their back. But a lot of God-haters say when they come across God that they will cuss Him or hit Him or whatever else, but He's a deadly presence. Exodus 33.20 says, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. He's a deadly presence to the wicked. And when we go to be with Jesus, we will get a glorified body that can stand in the presence of God. And sometimes I think that since hell is the presence of God's anger, then the reason people are burning and in unbearable pain is because God will not have equipped their soul with what it needs to withstand his presence because our God is a consuming fire and hell is where the anger of God is kindled. Now verse 4 says, For thou hast maintained my right and my cause, thou settest in the throne judging right. So he's still on the throne, even though people are trying to kick him off the throne. And the verse said, Thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Many people today say, I have my rights. But this is the right of David and Israel and prophetically the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is the righteous judge. He's going to sit in the throne judging right. He can't be dethroned and never will. He gives man dominion over things and places, but he has dominion over everyone who has dominion. And if you look at Ezekiel chapter 1, we're going to look at this throne. It says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was like the appearance, like was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward i saw as it were the appearance of fire 
and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bowl that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, and when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Notice Ezekiel fell upon his face, not fall back. But we see this throne. The Father and the Son are sitting in heavenly places, and one day the Son is going to come down and sit on his throne on earth. Hebrews 1.8 says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. When everyone is saying God is dead, he's still on the throne. When everyone is breaking his commands, he's still on the throne. And one day he will laugh at their calamity and mock when their fear cometh. But the Lord Jesus is going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem, and all nations shall flow into it, and they will come to hear him teach his word. And if they don't come to worship, if they don't come to worship Jesus Christ, then they will get no rain from their, for their crops. Now verse 5 in Psalms chapter 9 says, Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. So he is the name above every name. He's going to put out their name forever and ever. Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So he's going to put out the name of the wicked forever. And this will take place at the second coming and at the end of the millennium. A good portion of the wicked will be destroyed at the second coming and then at the end of the millennium. In great white throne judgment, evil men, evil spirits, and evil angels will be put out of remembrance. God is good with names. He won't forget anyone's name who is in the book of, the, book of life. He won't forget all the good things you've done. But he will destroy the name of the wicked. Verse 6, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. The Antichrist is called the son of perdition. He also goes by Abaddon and Apollyon, which means destroyer in Revelation 9-11. He will kill, steal, and destroy, but at the second coming, his destructions will come to a perpetual end. Verse 7, But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. He'll judge the saints at the judgment seat of Christ. He'll judge the nations at the second coming. He'll judge the wicked from all ages at the great white throne, along with saints from the tribulation and millennium. And while he sits as king in the millennium, he'll rule with a rod of iron and make all judgments from his throne. He'll be in complete control. Psalms 9-8 says, And he shall judge the world in righteousness, and shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. And if you look at Luke chapter 1, 32 and 33, it says, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jesus Christ will rule as perfect dictator and rule as a righteous judge. Uh, dictatorship only works out if you have the sinless God on the throne judging right. He always judges right. He can't make a bad decision. He can't make a bad choice. Who hath known the mind of the Lord and who hath been his counselor? He's not going to go to fake TV preachers about, you know decisions he's going to have all the decisions made up in his mind already he knows what he's going to say he's not going to have to go to anybody verse 9 the lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed a refuge in times of trouble in matthew 24 16 when those jews see the abomination of desolation they're going to flee to the mountains and the lord is going to protect them this is the time of trouble, specifically the time of Jacob's trouble. And the Lord is going to be the refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Psalms 32, 7 says, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. The Jews during that time 
will be fleeing from the Antichrist and his henchmen. They'll be protected from that flood that comes out of the mouth of the dragon. The Lord will be their hiding place, a place of refuge. And the verse said he is a refuge for the oppressed. In the time of Jacob's trouble, if a man doesn't take the mark, he can't buy or sell. He'll be poor and be oppressed by the rich man. Psalms 2, 6 says, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. You see, the rich men are going to be wicked men in the tribulation. The line between who's wicked and who's righteous in the tribulation will be very clear because the people who are, are righteous are going to be buying and selling. They're going to have the mark, and then you're going to have the poor people who are righteous, and they're going to be oppressed. Psalms 9.10 says, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. The Bible says a lot about seeking him, and many people should seek him, but they're seeking everything else. Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And we can just, we can take that practically to us today and seek his face. Hosea 5.15, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Seek the Lord. Draw not a God, and he will draw not to you. It's a shame, but the Lord who made the heavens just wants man to acknowledge him and seek him. The Lord, who has ways past finding out, desires fellowship with slime bags like us. And most people don't even pay him no mind. Psalms 911, sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. Colossians 3.16 talks about worshiping in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So proclaim the good things he's done for you. When you get an answer to prayer, write it down or you'll forget it. Psalms 912, when he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Those martyred Old Testament saints are going to be crying out for the Lord to avenge them. If you read in Revelation 6.10, it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So at the second coming, he's going to make inquisition for blood. He's going to be searching for the blood of the God-haters. The Lord doesn't really have to search, but you know what I mean. The blood will be up to the horse's bridles. It is his determination to gather the nations. The waters will be dried up so they can get together quicker. And so he can just shed their blood faster. Psalms 9.13 says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. So we have a God that's amazing. Because he considers man. Isn't it something that the God of everything considers man made from the dust of the ground? What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? He will take vengeance on your adversaries that hate you. Second Thessalonians 1 6 says, Seeing as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And verse 13 said, He will lift you up from the gates of death. In the Old Testament, the saints went to the heart of the earth when they died. The heart of the earth seems to have gates to hell, according to Jesus Christ in Matthew sixteen eighteen. It has bars, according to Jonah 2, 6. And the Lord has the keys of hell and of death, according to Revelation 1, 18. And he will lift you up from the gates of death in the sense that he will cause you to pass from death unto life. He will lift you up from death at the rapture when you shed this body of death. He will save any sinner, causing them from their eternal destination being hell, the gates of hell, to an eternal home in heaven. Psalms 9.14 says that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughters of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. When you don't have anything to look forward to, 
be happy about or wake up to or go on living for, you can still rejoice in the salvation of the Lord if you're saved. God preserved His Word. He preserved His Gospel message all the way up until now. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can rejoice in the fact that we've believed on that and He saved us. Psalms 9.15 The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made and the net which they hid is their own foot taken. They made their bed so they can lie in it. It says about the Antichrist in Revelation 13.10 he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. The same way he killed is the same fate he'll face. He'll be killed with a sharp two-edged sword. He's just digging. going to be digging his own grave. People are digging their own grave that they think they're digging for somebody else. Ecclesiastes 10.8 says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, hedge, a serpent shall bite him. It's like setting a trap for a lion, and then you get caught in the trap, and the lion eats you. And it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. At the second coming, he will show up as the lion, not the Lamb of God, coming to seek and save that which is lost. He's coming to seek and destroy and save the remnant that's still on earth. Psalms 9.16 The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. He gay and selah. All this work that the wicked is doing is just going to kill them. They will be snared in the work of their own hands. They have invented all these devices and gadgets to make sinning easier, but it's just a snare unto them keeping their mind a little bit more clouded up with the things of this world. The transhumanists are trying to get eternal life and glorified bodies through technology and machines, the work of their own hands, and it's just a snare unto them. Now some of them are saying if they went too far, the AI robots could just take over humans. And maybe that has some stuff to do with that iron mixed with miry clay or something. But they're going to be snared in the work of their own hands. Psalms 9.17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And this, I believe this applies specifically to that judgment of the nations. You see, Psalms is an amazing book because most of it is talking about something that hasn't even taken place yet. And you have people, Christians all over the place, reading Psalms and they're just getting comfort, comfort stuff out of it. But when you get into the doctrine and the prophecy in Psalms, it's one. it really is one of the most amazing books in the Bible when you don't just approach it for comfort, but for all this other amazing stuff that's in it. But Matthew 25 talks about the judgment of the nations. It says, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. But he's an unforgettable God. You may forget God for a time, but you'll soon remember. Hopefully not when it's too late. But America, a nation is Amer the nation America is on the road to hell. You you have here the love of many waxing cold. You have men blaspheming God, taking His name in vain, making wicked movies with horror and torture. You have sexual perversion, the pride parades. The pedophile parades where they expose kids to the nakedness of a bunch of child molesting sodomites. They have the drag queen story hour and libraries, public libraries, for the kids to hear some sissy boy tell them a story while he's dressed up like some whore on the street. Some sissy boy who doesn't even know which bathroom to go into. This country is set on the fires of hell. And if God blew this country off the map right now, he'd be just in doing so. Because there is some filthy, filthy people. Uh, Psalms 918 says, For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. 
Notice the continuous talk about the poor and needy because the Psalms are heavy in tribulation application. The Bible is written in such a way that any man from any age can pick it up and get something from it. But the Lord is going to take care of the poor saint in the tribulation who chooses the Lord over the mark of the beast and over worship of the Antichrist. Psalms 919, Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail, let the heathen be judged in thy sight. See that word arise, that has to do with the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at Malachi 4.2, it says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Man won't prevail against the Lord and his army at the second coming. It will be flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. Psalms 920 says, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. That's a lot of people's problem. They need to realize they're just men. Uh, you're not tough, no matter how big your muscles get, no matter how much you go to the gym. All it would take for God to have you begging for mercy is one little stomach bug who'll have you throwing up all night, calling into work, and have you feeling like you're on your deathbed. You need to know you're just a man. You can't compare to the Lord. Your body's going to grow old, and you're going to be on your deathbed, but the Lord is going to endure forever. And the God-haters refuse to fear the Lord. But Psalms 9.20 says, Put them in fear, O Lord. Romans 3.18 says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Lord is going to put them in fear. Imagine being on this earth as a lost Christ rejecter and looking to the eyeballs of Jesus Christ when he's coming on that white horse and he's got eyes of us as a flame of fire and they're just piercing through you. And you just see fire shooting out everywhere. You'll have the fear of the Lord then. But you should quit fearing man and fear the Lord. Fear him who is able to cast both soul and body in hell. The Bible says in the book of Matthew. But if you've made it this far and you're not sure if you're saved. And if you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be saved today. The Bible gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Colossians 1, 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus Christ died. He died by shedding his blood. He died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. And to be saved, all you have to do is come to him as a guilty sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all under sin. You need to get under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to get your sins paid for. All you have to do to be saved is come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe on Him and what He did on the cross to be your payment for sin. Quit relying on doing good things to pay off your sin debt that you owe. Only the Lord Jesus Christ and His shed blood can pay for your sin debt. That's why He died on the cross is so that you could have eternal life. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to be saved, come to Jesus Christ the best way you know how right now, and he will not turn you away.